Hi, can you hear me? That's yeah. probably loud. I, uh, <laughs> I'm going to stay on mute because there's going to be a lot of traffic here. I know, can we turn to you around? She's looking at us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have those in our class. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. She's on Zoom. What? Do you need me? No, Sheila, you're just staring at me with two big white glowing eyes. <laughs> I'm what? <laughs> you're good. Take a picture. Take a picture. Yeah, I'll text you a photo of what I see. It's very disturbing. You talk. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so what happens when you show up virtually? Yeah, well. There you go, you'll understand. Right. Are we ready? It's six o'clock, it is. All right, good evening, everybody. We'll begin our budget workshop for March 27th with courtesy of the floor. Anybody wishing to speak on agenda items or budget related items? There'll be another one at the end. Then, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Roy. Are you going to begin? I'll start. All yeah, right. Thank you. Uh, so, we have 28 slides for you for the budget workshop. And uh, we can open up the budget the workshop window right there. Yeah. Um, and but that includes a cover slide and a you know a generic question slide at the end. So um, the couple things I did want to mention um, that statewide now the the state funding is up to um one third um, I should say the funding that's going through the funding formula is now up to about one third of the total BEF. So remember when it was like nine percent, 10, 11 percent, you know, it's gonna take forever to get to putting all the BEF through the fair funding uh formula. So that's good. That's been and that's because it's been the increases that have that have come through. But of course, that means two thirds are still not not going through the formula, and that's where the level up comes in, and um, that has helped you know, districts like ours, the 100 most underfunded, to make some progress. Um, so that is not mentioned in the governor's proposed budget. So we'll see that tonight. We won't see level up tonight, I should say. So I want to make sure I say it um, because it's not in there. You'll also see that our budget at the end is. Um, I'm saying that we're 98% balanced, meaning we have a 2% gap, um, but 2% here is a pretty big number. So 98% balance sounds pretty good, but a 2% gap is um, nothing, you know, not a large hurdle. We'll just have to figure out how we want to close it, which is the board's uh, input to us at the end of the night. So um, budget timeline, we'll look at our priorities and strategic initiatives, and then how we're building the budget. Next slide. Our timeline, just to remind everybody, take a look tonight. We'll have a finance uh, meeting in, uh, and then the proposed final budget 
and then which is another look at the draft and then uh, and adopt the proposed final budget in May and then the final budget in June uh, as we you know continue to refine things. And the next few slides are um, tying our goals to the budget process. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Silva to uh, say a few things about that. Thank you, Dr. Roy. These should look pretty familiar from previous presentations. Obviously, when we're talking about when it's all said and done goals, we want our students to be doing grade level work, uh, whether that's in reading or applying literacy in uh, content areas, but grade level work for grade level kids, something that is our goal. Also, to have a clear path to a post secondary success, it's not enough anymore to say, well, I got 27 credits, four in English, four in social studies, four in science, and then not really be purposeful uh, credits. So having a, a clear a direction, a clear path to post-secondary success, which includes things from uh, career pathways, the job shadows, to dual credit agreements, many, many things we can do to support students in their path. And then third, that's all, when all is said and done goals, um, public schools are for the public. So to make sure that we are good citizens, that we're serving our community, and it's the community that provides for us, we help provide for that community. With that, there are certain paradigms and mindsets that we use. These are uh, from Covey, the Leader and Me program, but also within uh, the general vocabulary of effective leadership, where <clears throat> we have um, I think the belief that everyone could be a leader. Equity is necessary for excellence. Everyone has genius. Change starts with me, including me. empowering students to lead uh, in their own mode of their own learning and educators and families that working together towards a whole child. When you break that down into the organizational components, we're all about leadership, culture, and academics, and how those three uh, uh, columns or three pillars interact with each other and support our goals. And then finally, you see some factors influencing the budget process. So we'll turn that back over to Dr. Wood. And I'll kick it over to Mr. Casey. Well, thank you. So uh, as is fairly typical, we start off our budget process by really reviewing our academic priorities and programs. Obviously, that's the cornerstone of what we do. We are in the business of education, so we want to make sure we have the adequate number of student enrollment. We look at staff recruitment, we look at retention. Uh, really, we want to make sure that we have the resources available, not only to attract, but retain the qualified staff that we have in place. Uh, part of other things that we look at is outside economic factors, uh, inflation. You know, um, these are the things that are really directly beyond our control but affect us quite dramatically. So on, on one hand, inflation continues to be an issue. Um, you know, it's a concern. The Fed is really trying to stay ahead of it. They're raising interest rates. Um, they're really trying to sort of correct course, if you will. And on the other hand, you're starting to see a little bit of a crack in the financial side. So we have a fairly high inflation. Uh, we have a little bit of a stress in the financial industry, some of the banks failures. So what happens next is, is pretty much a, a guess, if you will. Uh, high inflation, banking failures, where do we end up? And then that's part of the thinking we have to go through as we draw the budget. Um, other factors we look at is obviously state and local funding, what's going to be available, uh, how much can we rely on them? And you know, a, a big factor for, for any district, especially on our size, is protecting our local local tax base. So we're always looking at uh, state funding that's available. We're looking at available uh, federal funding. We're looking at protecting our tax base. And lastly, we're looking at managing our charter school tuition. So all those factors can kind of come into play. And, you know, we, we toss it around in the big funnel and we come up with what you're going to see in the next couple of slides. Uh, wanted to focus on revenue first. So again, talking through the budget slides, we talk about the fact that influence and well, how much do we have to spend is usually a fact of discussion as we develop our plan and work through our priorities. Uh, I like to think of local revenue more or less the things that we can directly control. Those again are real estate taxes, uh, their EITs, their interest on investments, donations, things of that nature. 
when you look at the state revenue side, you're really looking at the subsidies. So we have basic ed funding, uh, we have special ed funding, uh, we have the transportation subsidy, and then the state reimbursement for their portion of Social Security and visa. Um, keep in mind that last number will change based on our actual expenses. So while you want to see a lot of that revenue come into play, you kind of don't want to see it because there's an associated expense. Um, and, and the federal sources for our purposes, we're going to just talk to our basic federal funding, which is the titles and the access. Uh, but historically, keep in mind that we've had some recurring one-time funding that we don't expect to see moving forward. So that'll all be part of the discussion as we move forward. All right. So sticking to our theme, this is the governor's proposal. And we're going to see some big numbers here. Uh, there's $8.4 billion that's allocated towards basic ed appropriations. Uh, there's no new level of funding at the same time. So what does that mean? That means we have $796 million going through basic ed. That's $567 million in new um, ADM allocations. And the $225 million that's coming in from prior year's level of them. You're going to see $1.4 billion in special ed appropriations. Um, that's an additional 103. I'm sorry, my slides are a little small. That's an additional 103 million um, compared to last year. And then we have two new block grants. One is specifically around school based mental health. Uh, that's very similar to the PCCD grant from last year, except the funding source is a little bit different. Um, I think the state is really, or at least the governor, is proposing a way that we can continue. Building momentum with that, that one time burden of the PCCD allocation. That's 100 million going towards that. And there's a formula based funding that says essentially you can get a 100,000 minimum for school districts and 70,000 for charter schools. Again, it's formula based, so there are different factors that go into that. The least you can get is 100,000. The most you can get based on the formula. And then lastly, there's a matching plan for environmental repairs and improvements. I don't have a lot of details on this as of yet, but it is supposed to be a match grant. Uh, as details come out, obviously we'll fill you in on that. So we have a lot of big numbers, and we skipped a little bit. But what do all these big numbers mean to us? Maybe next slide, please. Uh, essentially, it means that our basic ed funding is going to increase from 46 million to 52 million. So that's an 11 percent increase based on the governor's proposal. Uh, no new level of funding. Special ed increase about 874,000. And then that uh, school based mental health block grant, when you plug in the formula, unless they change it, we can expect about 260,000. Good news on that one is it's recurring, so we can expect that every year over year. Full on as it's funded. Keep in mind, this is exactly what it is a proposal. So as it gets handed out and goes through the process, we will likely to see changes, whether they go up or down. You know, it's been with yeah. Is that um, mental health grant something that you have to like, apply for so that only some schools might get, or is it kind of a grant for all of the districts within the state? It's a, allocation is available to all the districts within the state. Okay. There's still an application, but the application is more or less here's our plan to implement that okay. versus a competitive application where they were awarded based on the grant. Thank you. It was, and it was a good point. Um, that when it's a block grant as opposed to what it was last year, they tend to become ongoing. So it'll just they tend to just stay like next year there'll be the similar block grant. That kind of, so it's a way to get money into the budget sometimes without it, but for a specific purpose in this case, which is which is all good for us. For all in based on the governor's proposal, there's about six point five million dollars available in new funding. Um, that doesn't mean that we budgeted for all six and a half million dollars. So, because it is just a proposal, the next slide, Jamie. Um, we are really looking at what portion of that's going to come into play and what's really going to be realistic. This is a look at our local revenue. And you're going to see a lot of these slides as we move forward. So, I want to take a few minutes to explain what it is. On the left hand side, you have the actual. So we have 2021 actual, 21 22. We have the current year budget, which is what we're living in, in terms of 22 23. And then we have the preliminary budget, which is what our projection is for next year. So, for example, um, you can see in the local source revenue, we went from 
216 million in 21-22. Our budget is 218 million um, for 22-23. And our preliminary budget is 219 million for 23-24. Um, if you're doing the math behind the scenes, it's about a million dollar difference, or just about a half a percent. So this is things that are within our direct control. Going on to the state side of the revenue, um, we budgeted for approximately 85% of the governor's proposal. So we, we are seeing an increase in DEF allocation from 46 million to 51 million. Special ed is just about 9.9 million. Um, and you can see the rest of the subsidies. Again, touching on the state reimbursement for benefits, you do want to see a high number, but keep in mind there's an associated expense related to that. So all, all in all, we're looking at $102 million in state sources. That's based off of the 85% of governor's proposal for BEF and special law. And that's higher than we usually do. Um, but because the governor's budget was relatively modest, <laughs> Um, and that with the Democrats in control of the House and the governorship and no level up showing up yet, then um, we'll, we'll go a little higher in our guesstimate on what we'll finally end up with. Aaron? Just curious what's in that sort of all other state line that has a slight decrease. It bumped way up for this current year, but then it bumped out. Yeah, so some of the funds that are in there that we're taking out is a PCCD safe schools grant. That was about 600000 There's a reduced plan on reimbursements that are in there. Um, well, <laughs> if that ever comes out of more moratorium, we might be in decent shape. But right now, that there's a reduced expense. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But while our expenses for that might go up, because there's no much more funding, we're sort of playing that game with them. Um, and, and then there, there was uh, there was other small changes in there, but, but not the over the material. I think those are the two big ones. And and this is sort of my personal opinion, which I know I'm not supposed to share off on, on the budget presentation, but this may just be one of our last shots to get that being played in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, over the past three years, as Dr. Roy mentioned, there, there's been a, a quite a bit of increase in terms of state funding what's available. How long is that moment to keep going it is again part of our discussion moving forward. Okay, so federal revenue. We're gonna take this in two bites. First is the recurring nature of the of the federal revenue. So we do have the traditional titles and again, same format of the slides. Um, we can talk to our historical allocation that's been just about six million dollars or so. That includes the CSI funding for Brock and Middle School and um, you know, because there was an influx of state dollars that came in, whether it be the SCIM grant or BCCD dollars, I'm sorry, federal dollars that were passed through from the state, you're going to see some of these numbers decrease. But we will line that more so towards our historical allocations, and we'll make the updates in May when they come out. Right now, we're projecting about $6.7 million. Um, on the next slide, we're going to see the impact of COVID. And more or less, how those one time funds play the role in what we're doing in the district. Um, what I did was just list out the items that we've gotten, no real order of importance, just the order of funding. So um, in 2021, we got roughly $5 million budgeted. That was because of uh, the care spot. So that's right in the, in the middle of our code. 21 22, that number jumped to 10 million. And then we're looking at 4.3, that's in our current year budget. You can see that as we unwind these sort of one-time expenses and, and we spend down those funds, we're going to go from 10 million to 4 million down to 215,000. So naturally, there's been a huge benefit of, of what we've done with, with those funds. You know, we're obviously improving our programs, we're addressing learning zones. At the same time, because of the nature of the one-time funds, we're now putting an additional burden on how do we sustain the momentum? How do we continue to build off of those programs? What's the ATSI, the ATSI that we're still getting? Uh, ATSI is a school designation. I'm not sure what it actually stands for. It's school improvement funding from the state. Oh, okay. Or passed through the state. But that's not, it's not specific to the COVID. It's no. more general. Okay. Well, in, in this instance, it's the ARP ATSI. So this is the COVID allocation that is specifically designated to our high schools. 
Uh, there is also an ATSI designation that's part of the state funding that's separate than this. So there's a state source for that, and then there's a federal source for that. This is more or less the federal, and you'll see the ARP, which is tied to the federal stimulus. So all of this is basically COVID-related stimulus that was passed through one way, shape, or form to the district. Uh, so again, you can see the big reduction. Uh, just from year to year, we're looking at about a $4 million reduction. That's directly because of the one-time funds. Um, and, and you might be thinking, well, we have some HVAC repairs. What about those? Where do they go? Those are out of the capital funds, not necessarily part of this one. That's why you're not seeing that on the again. So when you look at the big picture, in terms of revenue, we again, our primary source is the things that we can control, which is through the taxes. You're looking at 67% state sources, which is that blue circle, um, 31% that's in terms of state, and then the small percentage of the federal dollars. So we have an projected revenue of $329 million. And if I just interject, and as we, that's an improvement, right? We used to always be over 70% local, right? 72%, something like that. Um, and so that is an improvement that the state, again, you can see the difference that the increase in state funding uh, has made. We're not there yet, but it's moving in the right direction. Do we have any idea where the, um, I mean, I know Pennsylvania has always been pretty low in terms of the state allocations of school funding. Do we want to? Is this an improvement vis a vis other states? I mean, or, you know. I love the county. <laughs> Here it goes. Okay. I'm looking at Karen. Nationally, it's about half of a district's budget would be okay. Would be local. All right. And so we're we'll still well, for the rest. You can see how to the federal allocation and for the rest would be the state contribution to that district. Okay. So we're still comfortably above that sort of typical national. Yeah, Pennsylvania used to be 47th yeah. in the state in the nation. And I can't imagine over the past few years we've jumped more than maybe 40th. Yeah. But overall it was 12th, I believe, Karen, right about the level of funding for public ed, which shows how much the local taxpayer picked up right. between yeah. the state funded and where school were funded. You can't all yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any questions on the revenue side? We're going to kick it over to our expense side of the house. And one of the main expenses behind salaries and benefits is our charter school. This is new this year. No, I'm kidding. How many of you have different colors? Same colors? We the same color. Sorry. Well, what I wanted to highlight here is pre pandemic, you can see our enrollment was starting to sort of stabilize. In fact, it was actually starting to trend down. Then because of COVID, our enrollment went to almost 2,200, and now we're starting to slowly but surely trickle down. This is overall um, overall enrollment. So this includes charter schools in, in the cyber academies or the brick and mortar schools. When you go on to the next slide, you're going to see what's changed. So while the enrollment is somewhat flat, you can start seeing the trend up of the percentage of special ed students. So as we look at our census counts, you can see See that we went from 12% to 14, and now we're currently sitting at 18%. Uh, why does that matter? Well, we pay based on the mix of students, right? So while enrollment is somewhat stagnant and stabilizing, you can see that the percentage of special ed is are in the free bottom. On the next slide, thank you, David. You can see again pre pandemic levels, this is more or less the cybers, where we were what happened during the pandemic and how it's continued to peak up. And the only difference between our normal while it's relatively flat is that percentage mix of special ed students. Um, the orange color is the special ed students. Uh, the blue color is the gen ed students. Overall enrollment in the, in the charters, uh, cyber charters, I should say, you're looking at about 450 students. Which is like double what it was pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, this is just a representation of our brick and mortar. So, so you can see the district has done a really good job of stabilizing and in fact, increasing the enrollment. It's the cyber charters that are really the biggest threat at this point in time. Uh, the yellow is uh, the special ed students and the gray is the regular students. So when you factor in the enrollment mix versus our tuition rates on the next slide, um, you can see how the tuition is sort of picked up. In fact, we'll project 
and a 4% increase in the special ed rates, so 32,000 per student, um, and a 6.5% increase in the regular ed students. You can see the annual um, expenses have continued to creep up, obviously, as our budget grows, so does this expense. Um, one thing I do want to highlight, the annual rates are not final yet. They're all based on the ADM. The final ADM number does come out and is published in May, I want to say. Uh, so they are likely to change, but they're not going to change drastically from where, where we see them right now. Our budget is going to be based off of these numbers, um, and then they go up or down so. I know we know this, but I'll just repeat it anyway. The special ed charter tuition is one of the um, lowest hanging fruits for the legislature to fix on the funding because uh, charter schools do not educate high need special education kids. We do, but they are paid based on basically the average of our expenses. So students who have, you know, OT for a short period of time versus our students with, you know, multiple uh, handicapped, multiple issues um, that could cost uh, 30, 40, 50 or more thousand dollars a year, which we don't in any way mind paying to take care of our kids. But the point is the charters get the average of that, but they don't have the higher end kids. So we, they are getting, they are just incredibly overpaid for the uh, special ed kids that they have. There was a commission at the state years ago now that looked at this bipartisan, said this doesn't make sense. Charters should get paid the way school districts get paid, which is in three levels, depending on the needs of the child, you get reimbursed, which makes sense. Get reimbursed based on what you're actually spending. Um, and the legislature, when the charter lobby came out, sent kids to the Hill, um, and said that a vote for that reform, common sense reform is a vote against school choice. People knuckled under and they didn't pass it. So there's hope this year that there might be a push for uh, and a realization, especially as our numbers are not unique. I mean, there are not, there's many, many people whose special ed numbers are much higher than that tuition. Recognition that, hey, this is like, this is just a common sense fix. Doesn't cost us more money, uh, doesn't cost the state more money, but it saves us, it saves us that that amount. Doesn't put more money into the system, I should say. It allows more money to stay at the home school. So I'm I'm hoping and we're gonna make this a focus uh, of I know every group is making a focus of their advocacy efforts. But this is you can just, I mean, it's just jumps out. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> Thanks for giving me that so fast, Harry. I'm sure. I told Harry to please only correct me if I was off by more than two million. <laughs> Stacy used to correct me if I was off by like 50 cents. <laughs> so I tried to buy a little more leeway. <laughs> Next slide, Jimmy. And just oh, sure. real quick, a related point, sort of other low hanging fruit is um, the tuition paid to brick and mortar charter schools that yes. also operate buildings and like lights and electricity and all those kinds of things versus cyber charters, which don't. Um, those two types of charters get the same tuition from the district. And so another kind of low hanging fruit to align tuition payments with cost to educate students, special ed and cyber charters. I'm sure they're going to talk about that. And we have so many examples because. Pretty much every district has their own or partners to have the cyber full time cyber programs now. So we know what that costs. And it's <clears throat> less than half what we're paying out. And and when it's special ed, you know, it's a third of what we're paying out or let, even less. So on, on the expense slide, we're, we're actually budgeting for 336 million in expenses. And you can see the biggest increase is our investment in our SAP. So the, the salary line is increased by um, an additional $4 million. On the benefit side, we, we're getting a little bit of relief because the, the state pension rate for Beezers has actually gone down from 35.26 to 34. So that's a 3% reduction. So while we, we have increased the salaries and we continue to invest in our staff, the reduction of these is, is actually helping us uh, keep our benefit line somewhat flat. Um, 
you can see that the charter school expenses, just based on the new mix of um, rates as, as well as the mix of special ed versus gen ed, is about $37 million. All the others are relatively flat. Uh, so we're looking again at a projection of $336 million at this point. Another way you're looking at our expenses, uh, as you can expect, the bulk of our expenses are instruction and instructional support. Uh, so 300 million of that 334 is, is being spent on instruction and instruction support. Uh, and the facility construction number uh, seems very low it's because we're actually utilizing the capital funds. So it's not that we're not maintaining our, our district and our facilities, we're just using our capital reserves to do so. Um, these are some of the planned investments for next, next uh, upcoming year. Uh, we are looking at a new student information system, and we're going to hear more about that in the selection process uh, during next month meeting. We're looking at uh, cyclical investments into our uh, transportation, our curriculum, uh, our student staff, uh, safety, as well as um, security cameras, fit for life, mental health. Um, just kind of a flavor of some of the things that we are looking at for next year. So putting all that into perspective, uh, you can see where, again, instruction and instructional support makes up about um, 300 million of that budget. Uh, putting it into perspective, you're looking at 97%, if not higher. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, putting it all together. So we have revenue of 329 million, uh, projected expenses at this point of 336 million, which gives us a gap of $6.7 million, or about 2% of our budget. So as Dr. Corey said, we're 98% there. We just have to refine some of our expenses and um, let's see what happens until the governor's budget proposal. So what happens from here? Uh, essentially, we're, we're gonna go back to the drawing board a little bit. Um, and we're going to have some decision points. We're going to look at decisions on instructional um, programming. We're going to look at what do we do with the behavior coaches that we obtained because of those one-time funds. What do we do with the instructional coaches? Uh, what do we do with the positions that were created? We're going to look at one-time expenses, perhaps the SIS or some of the transportation costs, and see if we can use the fund balance. Does that make sense? Um, lastly, we're going to consider whether or not tax increase is something we want to move forward with our proposed. So we're, we're weighing our options, really looking at the expenses and, and, uh, and the projected revenues, keeping an eye on the targets and, and really trying to refine the budget. Can you just to clarify, the instructional behavioral coaches are included in that previous slide numbers, right? Correct. Okay. Well, let me restate that. <laughs> <laughs> the existing teachers will go back to their home, home school, if you will. Okay. If we wanted to add additional coaches, then we would have to create the coaching position. So exactly. most of the support. Okay. So then the expenditure on the big side would go. Yes, okay. because we would then have a whole new FTE okay. position. Okay. Thank you. And that's a that's a huge piece because yeah. you know we want to have them in the budget. Right. Because they've been effective uh instructional coaches, but even more so behavioral. Well, I don't want to say more so. They've all been uh all, all have been uh great contribution, which was our goal, was to build capacity, right? But the behavior coaches have been particularly um, useful with the spike in, in uh, social emotional issues that schools, have, our schools and every school have seen post COVID. Um, and so though that our desire is to maintain that. Um, so that is part of, that's why we put it in there as part of the decision-making. Um, and the fund balance, as Harry mentioned too, this doesn't, our revenue that was shown here doesn't include anything taken from fund balance. We usually do that at the end, we decide how much we want it. But as, just to reiterate what Harry said, there are some larger one-time expenses in this budget. The new student information system, uh, again, that you'll hear more about in, a, in another week or so, a couple of weeks, that's, that's going to be 1.5 million. Um, so we pull fund balance to take that, you take down, it, it, you know that well that increases our our expenditure our uh, revenue by 1.5 million reduces that gap the transportation the buses the van was another approximately 1.5 million so if we pull from fund balance 
That's another. That's, so that's three million of the six point seven million that gets gets the gap gets closed because we're pulling the revenue from the fund balance. Um, so um, that, that's kind of where we are. So that number is not in any way alarming, um, but it means we still have work to do. But I wanted to make sure the board knew this doesn't include any revenue pulled in from the fund balance from savings at this point. <clears throat> So what we're on the slide, there, how many coach positions did we add last year? Or how many are currently in the grant line? There's nine available at the outer 15 total. 15 total. 15, 15, 15 total that were paid by ESSER or related fund. Yeah. And in the current budget that we're seeing tonight, none of those are included. Those people are back in their previous assignments or doing something. There is no 15 coaches included in the current budget. Well, the only thing included, included in the current budget would be uh, the usual 15 LTSs that we put in there, okay. not knowing who's going to need a leave of absence and that kind of thing. Let me rephrase that then. If we want to have, have, keep things as they are with those nine behavior coaches and then the math and literacy, how many positions do we need to add? Like just a ballpark dollar. The cost wise. would be 15 LTS. 15 LTS positions. LTS is what you'd have to back to. Well, will we make an LTS as well, or will we make a permanent position? Yeah, they might become permanent. Oh, uh, well, that depends on you know, what you want to do. Yeah. Okay. That would be good. Yeah. Right. So, my previous Stacy math, I'm sorry, Eric. Um, <laughs> 12 positions used to be about a million, so we're probably pushing 2 million at this point for 15 a less, positions. Less, a little less. 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 Yeah, okay. We were looking at about 1.7. Okay. We had the initial conversation. Yeah. Okay. So, it's still a significant investment, but. It's good to have an idea of where we're looking at. Right, and and, uh, and we wouldn't necessarily need to decide to have 15 coaches again. Sure. You might say, you know, and some of the schools do trade-offs. Yeah. Hey, I'd rather do this than have that instructional coach. Um, so it might not be 15, it might be 12, it might be, but it will be in that range. But that's the top for us to consider. Yeah. We'll try to figure out fund balance and tax rate. Absolutely. And, anything else. And, and yeah, absolutely. And matching that, right, that's a top from what we have this year okay. um and then again we don't know where you know we took a little a higher percentage of the proposed governor's budget into revenue but um you know we might if, if we get a level up on the side of that then that revenue will go up and last year i think we had 3.8 million in, in uh, level up so that could change our calculus dramatically if we see that yeah. in the so, Yes. Yeah, I am fairly confident that we will get the governor's budget as presented, if not higher, and some sort of level up. That's been the chatter okay. at the moment. I don't know. Just that. I know he said we have 85%. So if we get that additional. Then it's going to be around a million dollars. And then, and then if we get any level, get a level up, so yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And we still have, you know, even taking three million from fund balance for those larger one time expenses doesn't mean we couldn't take another couple of three million from fund balance. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm never one to ask for more slides. <laughs> What's the current fund balance? We used to, let's make it you know, let's make it <laughs> one slide. <laughs> What's in the fund balance? Uh, and I know that's a loaded question. I know, I know this. Okay. I'm <laughs> um, we currently have a fund balance of about $20.9 million, which is about 7% of our expenses. Okay. And that is that's unrestricted. That's yeah. not capital. That's not the money we want to sit there for bonds. Right. That's that's currently the honest. Okay, so we do have a, a healthy enough fund balance. To... Doesn't the uh, isn't there a recommended fund balance for both the yeah. yeah, about eight yeah. percent is on is the recommendation from the state. That's a maximum. Okay. Yeah. That's a GAF fee. Our policy is five to eight percent. Policy is five five to eight. And then the other possibility is a small tax increase to close the gap as well. Yeah, I know it's not always the popular route and something, you know, if we consider other options first, but three out of four years we haven't raised taxes and we know what inflation is and we know what utility costs and everything goes up. Um, I think we're still a ways from talking about that, but 
And one mil, Harry, if I, my notes are correct, one mil equals uh, about 700,000. Just as you know. Right. I will have to go back and a right. little check. But it's out. under the 2 million limit, so you don't have to fact check. Yes. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's over 50 cents in the two day. <laughs> Was there more on here? Do you open up for other questions? Like well, it, it, essentially, our next steps, if like we sort of talk through, we're going to go back and, and review what, what is what is the revenue expectations. We're going to review some of the expenses we have in place. Um, I, I'm somewhat optimistic we'll get a little bit more federal revenue. I, I am hopeful that we will get some of the level of funding. I, I do hear some of that chatter through the Pasville community. What that ultimately looks like, you know, is to be determined. Uh, so we will reconvene April 17th with an updated uh, proposal during the Finance Committee. At that point, we do want to have some preliminary projections as well, sort of give us a sense of what surplus, if any, there is from this year, and what we can allocate towards next year's expenses in terms of an assigned balance. Um, we will come back on May 15th to adopt the proposed final budget, uh, and then we'll have a special board meeting to adopt the final budget on June 19th. Can I... Can I... Um, ask for the board's some feedback though on keeping the projects. I mean that that the plus on expenditures that we then have to find the matching revenue. But our hope, our recommendation is let's keep them. But that's you know that was they they came into existence because of the extra money. We put them in positions we thought would be of value. They have been of value, um, but that doesn't mean we have to continue to do that. But yeah, there's go ahead. I would just say based upon the fact that I don't think we've actually recovered from the pandemic, the learning loss of the pandemic. Uh, to stop now, we really appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I agree with that, Dr. Shadow. Um, and so with the coaches, about how many kids do they well, ideally, the coaches are teaching, they're coaching the teachers because we want to build the instruction. Oh, they're in the okay. yeah, sure. um, However, so that on the literacy side, on the on the um, SEL side, behavioral coaches, because of the level of need exhibited by students across the district, young and young, you know, all the way up, K to 12, the coaches have spent a lot of time, what I call firefighting. You know, going to the situation, working intensely with kids in classrooms. So we haven't got the full. We we didn't, we haven't had the capacity building full. They haven't. You know, they're teaching teachers how to manage behaviors that maybe are outside what we've been used to. But there has been less of that. So there's a lot more work to do there because they have been working one on one with kids when there's a when there's a. a Prices to be dealt with. I mean that that's good to know because then when we're out calling people, or people ask us about what are these coaches, what are they doing, how do how do they help? It's good to know sort of precisely, not precisely, but at least in general what they're doing yeah. um, and why they're important. Yeah, and the behavior coaches, I think, you think about the elementary schools, you know, all but two, right, have, have don't have assistant principal, so just a principal and a guidance counselor. And the principal's doing lots of things as it's going. So if there's a child with, you know, significant mental health needs and are pushing in, and the behavior coaches are helping as the special ed folks are coming in and building building plans uh, to support the children and so forth and evaluate them, um, there's not a lot of resources at the school buildings to, to firefight yeah. um, because the teachers are teaching the kids. So I, I I support sort of continuing if we can find a way. Maybe for next month, for April. We had an early presentation when it first kind of got kicked off. A uh, few of them were here. Can we hear more about what's happened this year and how they were? And I don't need you to drag them all out, but sure. Just kind of give us an update of how it's going, some of the things they're doing, and if it's great idea. Because I know we don't know a whole lot. Like I look to you guys on this one. Um, and then maybe just the consideration is, do we make them permanent? Do we keep them LTS one more year? Like, are we, do we add 15 positions if maybe we're only gonna need eight or 10 long-term? Um, but maybe we do, maybe they all need to stay forever. Is there a benefit to LTS 
or full time or benefit like not pay certain benefits or pension? We we don't lay them off. The LTF is hired for a year okay. at a time. But they still aren't pension. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I'd also love to hear if possible from the a class of the teacher who would. Um, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, exactly. Who had the help and, and to just kind of speak to them that, you know, just to, to get that feedback as well. In, in those budget negotiations, Mike was just talking about, could we look at maybe over three years saying this year we'll bring in so many of those LTSs as permanent, pick certain ones that we feel are really critical, whether it's mental health or whether it's the classroom coaches and say, okay, this year is three, the next year is three, the next year is three, and we keep some of the LTSs just to kind of spread it out over a period of time rather than doing a lot. Make that That's decision. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't make them all permanent, but yet keep that window with me there. Yeah, I mean, we'll look for some information on that. I just need to bring people in and then have something change and have to shut the shuffle. Thank you. Mrs. Becker. Uh, obviously, money is an issue. I would be more in favor of keeping on the behavioral coaches if, if we had to make a choice, because I think we have a huge issue right now with behavior, and I think a lot of that is also infecting or some of those behavior issues can be addressed. I, I feel like that could also have a positive effect on the instruction that's going on in the classroom. Great. Kind of related to that, and following up on sort of recovery from pandemic, that sort of school plan of behavior, as far as other people that have been very helpful in that situation or that to have more of them, not forever and always, but maybe for another year. Those, whether it's all monitors, I know Brockle was experimenting with the community-based, yeah. um, you know, folks from the community helping serve as just other adults during the passage time. I don't know if that kind of brought, from um, comments that have made to me, I know that high schools could always use those types people. I think kind of related to it, not the adult coaches, but just additional adults in the building. Um, and so I don't know if those folks fall under some of our mental health grants or school safety grants, or if those would be considered as part of some of these efforts. Or our sort of budget. Well, they're not considered, right, they're not in that batch. You correct. Yeah. Not, right. We do have uh, I may have differing opinions on that, I guess. I think we have a good number of hall monitors. We have uh, two SROs at one high school, one at another, just to be in, just to be human beings, human beings. adults in the hallway. Yes, that's what I'm right. We have a good handful or more of administrators. Uh, and um, so there are people that can be out during transition, including all the teachers in the building as well. Um, so I don't think there's any shortage of adults who can make themselves visible in the hallways during the change of process. Just like to add, and I understand where Shannon's coming from as far as the discipline, and I agree. You, know, you can't teach if the kids aren't paying attention. My only concern, and, and this is maybe more in favor, not in favor of over the mental health, but equal to the instructional coaches, is that until the colleges that are creating, uh, that are minting the new teachers as they're coming out are in line with all the work that we're doing. I think, and even some of our veteran teachers who may not have been through that, I think it's really encouraged, especially for those young teachers. I'm not sure what our new staff hire is going to look like. Even a veteran come from another school district that's going to come to Bethlehem. There aren't many school districts doing what we're doing curriculum wise. And I think those coaches to help those teachers. In literacy and mathematics are really important for us to keep that momentum going in the curriculum area. So I, I do agree with you as far as the, the mental health. And I guess what I'm trying to say is I think we need them both. Yeah. I'm not sure we can prioritize one over the other. Just because I think we need that curriculum training until the colleges kind of get on board. Okay. 
other questions around anything in the budget or the budget process? Mr. Lewis. In regards to uh, looking through the different um, pools of money here, when we look at some of our schools that have services that are communities, community schools, um, I know most of that funding really doesn't come through our budget process. But the oversight of that, building that out, and seeing the good that it's done within our district, are we allocating, are we looking? Thank you. I know. How are we expanding that? And is that within this budget? Because I think of schools like Freemansburg, um, Calypso schools that maybe are not community schools by name, but probably should be, and you know, are not doing the work. You know, and you know, Rob and Peter to pay Paul, you know, to do that work. So, how are we supporting them, or how are we supporting the district overall? Well, we the, the spread of the community schools has been in partnership with the United Way and finding and right. finding funding from the outside. You're correct, um, but the the buildup of of internal supports like social workers, the outpatient clinics, and everything that's happened at all of the schools to build up those mental health schools. So what the community, the non-community school schools don't have is a full-time person to be making the outside connections for programs, um, helping to set up uh, clothing closets and all of that. But for the inside, they're not, the community schools, um, by and large, they're not receiving uh, I think it may be one or two examples, but they're finally not receiving uh, like mental health support through the community school. Mm -hmm. We're providing that through all of our mechanisms. So, you know, are we, and we we put money towards the community schools. Mm -hmm. We contribute money um, um, that help pay for some of the school coordinator, community school coordinator, the after school coordinators we're now paying for. Um, the um, yes, I like that was doing a couple of years late for certain. I know, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> no, 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 you stayed off of that one with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, so are we are we budgeting to add community school coordinators now? Right, right. And, and I thank you for saying that wasn't my question, but that did that does provide context. So I know that the oversight of that is really within Eric and or Mr. Mm -hmm. Martinez, Dr. Capers mm -hmm. office. So when it comes to, I guess, the facilitation of that piece, like, is there other stuff that we do that we should be considering to pay for? Is there things that 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 from, I guess, from their office, like, would they need, do they need another person to help lift that stuff from our end that needs to be done. And if so, how do we do that? You know, that, so that's more so, I don't know if that's necessarily an answerable question, but that's just something that came to my mind. I don't think so. I don't think so right now. Um, and I think what the, the oversight is not running, like with Mr. Fontanez, we, do, we want to make sure we are learning across the schools and mm -hmm. sharing ideas and resources and partners across the schools. So he's kind of, he's doing them the connecting up here, not doing the work down in the schools. So, I, I, so we, if, if I'm understanding you, there, there may not at this point. There's not a need to have a dedicated person in that way. Do, like what he does is doing that, and the schools that are doing that, that learning is happening. So you don't need right now. We don't need some right anything additional to make that work. Okay, because he's, he's really that's a new role. Right to have someone that um, providing that direct oversight and uh, connections. Okay. Any questions? Sorry. Yep. Um, one other that relates to debt service. That just if there's anything we think that we don't have any big facilities project. That HVAC systems are underway thanks to a lot of federal dollars, and so we saw that those really aren't part of this budget. But if in years ahead. If in the next five years, we would have any for more of those payments. Is there anything we need to worry about with this budget? For this budget, no. Long term, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
So we should have a question. Um, for the local revenue in the 2022 23 budget, budgeted numbers, are we on track to hit them? Yeah, we're actually uh, pretty darn close. What, what's holding us up right now is a little bit of the delinquent taxes. Um, why I say that is there, there was a little bit of a snafu on the phone off end. And so they weren't able to get the notices out until recently, which could cause a little bit of a delay, but I'm pretty optimistic that we'll start collecting the delinquent revenue in time. Uh, EIT were doing very well. And uh, like I said, I, I plan on coming with some projections on the revenue side. Uh, so we can see whether or not there, there's a surplus in next year's budget. That'll be part of April. And you, you've taken into account, I guess, kind of real estate slowing down a little bit, transfer tax. The, the transfer tax, and you can see in the local revenue, there's a big bump that happened. That's all because of COVID. Well, now it's a matter of how well do you project whether or not that'll go down and how much. So we're a little bit concerned about an investment side that ties to our investment portfolio. Are the rates going to continue to be at four and a half, five, six percent, or is that going to start trending down as the financial sector hits? So it, it, it's sort of a delicate balance. I think we're a little bit conservative in our estimate, but given that we're budget and finance office, we have to be conservative. We do, we do just as a, as a um, reminder in the monthly board meetings at our voting meeting, we have the state of the budget attachment that that tracks, you know, percentage of. Uh, Increase of, of collected revenues or expenses, um, you know, against the uh, budgeted amount. So we should keep an eye on that as well. Yeah, it's the budget to actual as part of the treasurer's report, so you can get a flavor of where we are in that period as well as year to date. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of smaller ones. Um, do we have with interest rates coming up? Do we have any bond refinancing coming up in the next fiscal year? No, but we do have the mandatory tenders on the voting rate notes. Okay. So it would be in 26. So the earliest is 25. The okay. latest is 26. Okay. So we still got a ways to go on those. Yeah. We, we do have some callable bonds, uh, but it's not efficient to go out right now and just put the rates yeah. as they are. Uh, we will keep an eye on that as part of our overall process. No, I was looking more at those two or three years that we would do on the side. Yeah, that's nothing yet. The mandatory okay. tenders are 26. Okay. Good. Um, Another note I saw recently that girls wrestling finally hit that hundred club mark. Do we and PIAA in theory could sanction? Is that an expense to us if that happens? I mean, we have most of the framework. I know it wouldn't be major. Well, we put the coaches in. Mm -hmm. I think at a like an assistant coach rate because the season wasn't as long, so we'd have to make minor minor adjustments. But we wouldn't have like a PIAA fee or anything. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. It would I just make it twice four. Okay, so if that came. Um, we are getting wrestling mats, as you saw. I did. Well, that's what sparked in my head. If that becomes sanctioned, does that cost us more outside of our own control? It was like so small. It's expensive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just a mats. And there's having a zero. You know, well, one step at a time. All right. And then last year we added theater money for the first time stipends. Is that in the budget again? Harry, can you confirm that? Yeah, it is. Actually, we, we, we have money set aside for both the theater and the music programs. Right. And, and we've centralized those so that it's not a free for all. It's controlled by Joe's group. Um, I, I'm not sure his official title is. We don't have to see it. Yeah. Related arts makes sense. Thank you. Excuse me, a uh, question. Yes, Dr. White. I forgot you were there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure I heard that clearly. The um, the money for the musicals is that for the programs or for the directors? And is it you said it was all pooled into one space? It, it's the programs, and, and so there's an allocation for each of the middle schools and the high schools, and it's both by mu music as well as the theater program. Okay. Uh, why I was pulling it in, into uh, Joe's budget is because then he can directly control A, the purchasing power, what goes in, what goes out, and then he has a little bit of the same above and beyond the principles in terms of the programming that, that gets implemented. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then um, is this something that the um, parent organizations that usually do fundraisers are also being made aware of, or how is this information being shared out? I, I don't think that has an effect on fundraising overall. It was more of, in the past, 
the management of those funds didn't really have a logical place to rest. Well, and it was under me. But <clears throat> that meant sometimes it was used for equipment, sometimes it was used right. for some stipends, sometimes. But overall, as the budget is presented, it has the levels that we're used to to support the theater program and the, and the instrumental program. The difference is it's uh, concentrated under one person's oversight, which is probably going to bring greater efficiency and stretch the dollars more than it did when no one really owned that. Oh, no, I, I agree. My, my question is in terms of getting that information out. After the... Um... Now is the time where directors are deciding what programs or what titles they're going to be doing next year and with rot licensing and, you know, to be able to budget with whatever they might need. This is when they need to know what available funds they have. So um, if this yep. is information that can be shared before the budget is formally approved, that would help the programs continue their planning cycle in, yeah, instead of backwards. No, we don't. We don't tell people what their money is before the budget is approved. Okay, that's not, that's not a good practice. Um, but um, and I assume they're all watching the budget workshops. So. <laughs> Taking notes. <laughs> make, but we'll make sure that I'll tell you. We'll make sure the principals uh, pass the word on. But but we always are cautious about and because again, you're thinking of that one group. But we have you know every group across the district and every program that we don't um, tell them to plan for next year on a budget that's not approved yet. Oh, no, I understand that. This is one whole new step for them. So I, I will follow protocol. Thank you so much. I'm muting. And just to follow up Dr. White's uh, directors and um, I'm going to say directors, uh, what would we call the head of the band? I'm sorry. Conductor. Conductors. The people in charge, <laughs> sorry, those stipends are directly in the BEA contract. So those are all stipulated. So this is just referencing any support money that's going to the actual organization program. Other questions? Dr. White, anything else while we have you? Oh, you'll have me forever, but no more questions now. Well, now that I remember we have you. <laughs> I <laughs> there you're happy and I forgot. <laughs> Other questions from anybody on the board? Mr. Losey. In terms of revenue, um, remind me again, because it's been a while, I think it was maybe this time last year that the city was here, going over the, the redistricting of like the stuff down. Lerda. Lerda, thank you. That was, I couldn't think of the, the acronym. Um, with all of the new development within South Bethlehem, how does that look for our tax base? Like, is a lot of that covered under the Chris Niz? I don't know what our, I don't remember yeah, our township too. Yeah, township as well. Yeah. Are we getting any of that money? That's what I'm saying. But in, in terms of the Lerda, I've only had one application in my tenure here. Um, my understanding of the program is it, it's going to take several years for you to actually recognize the revenue. So, on the one hand, short sighted, you're losing out on the revenue and potential taxes on, on the long run. Because those properties are being developed, it will impact your tax base, and you will start seeing positive growth. In my time, I've only seen one property application, um, so I'm not sure how that one property will play out in, in the grand scheme of things. But we do have interim taxes that we budget for based on what's happening around the areas and the development activity. Uh, that's part of our local revenue. Could you just define the interim tax? What that is? Um, so, as, as people go out and get a permit for reconstruction or there's some improvements. There's an interim assessment that happens uh, on that property. We will bill on the interim assessment once the project is finalized. Uh, then they go out there and they assess the value, and let's say the value is higher or lower, and we chew up at that point, and that, that property becomes part of overall things. I don't think there's a lot of new things going into Lerner because it kind of shrunk down from what it was at one point. Um, and most of that's built out already with dual word of so you're getting your increment 10 percent each year for 10 years yeah. so there's a lot of other construction well yeah. there's a lot of other construction but not all of it's murder right now right. word is shut down yeah. and then the chris doesn't the affect us okay that's that's Alan. that's well chris chris has bethlehem but it's state taxes only okay so I, so let me let me be and it's new information it's not so like if you drive through 
Fifth Street or Morton Street or whatever in, in South Carolina, and you see properties going from second floor to third floor to increase the amount of beds they have that they can run out. And you see these major buildings that are coming up and they're being built by developers whose names I won't put on the record, which you know, so be pretty nice. But I'm just saying, by prominent developers in the area, are what is what is are they is are they being sick? Are they paying taxes on the new yeah. 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 And that's what you factor into just some of the natural revenue growth from real estate Correct. taxes. Yeah. yeah. And 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 I guess I'll be very clear. We don't go out there as a district and say, hey, let me see if you have a permit or what the property we're really having the city to go out and, and do the interim assessment. Mm -hmm. We do have a point of county Now we actually do the interim assessment. How it works. The building permits from the city of Bethlehem get sent down to the county's assessment office. Mm -hmm. They take the value that they put on there for their improvements. They factor that into the existing space and they come up with a new interim assessment. So mm -hmm. if you ever add like a porch to your house, you're going to get an, an interim bill on the middle of the year mm -hmm. for, for the same thing happens to these guys. And that is a way for us to get a feel for as we see the interim assessments on how much activity there is going on. Ultimately, they, everybody ends up on the tax rate. Okay. All right. So there's not folks that are, or are they skating away, but like they're deferring because they've been put into the specialized tax bracket. So that's good. Yeah, I know the city, the problem on the city did put that one about potentially West Side Bethlehem, but I understand that's kind of yeah. not going to happen now. Yeah. I've heard a thing. Well, then I guess at this point, um, do you need more specific direction from us? And then from what I'm hearing, everybody's open to options at this point, as far as the board goes. Right. We'll work on the coaches for sure. Let's see what adjustments that makes. And then we can come back with recommendations on, on revenue changes from the state, recommendations for fund balance, pulling any other expense changes that up or down that we have. And then come back, you know, with the game plan for, for a balanced budget. Um, and then, and, you know, and we'll, yeah, we have the next month, we still have time to, to get into a final position. Yeah. So, really, when you're May 15th is more of a target for having a finished product than April 17th. Um, if you have thoughts or other questions, please email any one of these three. Um, and get those questions answered. Don't wait for the April 17th meeting. That way they can be prepared and have the information. If you, for some reason, are uh, just strongly opposed to a certain, you know, raising taxes or taking the fund balance or whatever it is, just the sooner we know, the better, because they that way they can present a plan that we're all ready to support and approve. All right. Have you wrote anything else? No, thank you. Gave you anything? No, no thank you. Thank you. So, your daughter? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. If there's nothing else, we have courtesy the floor to wrap up. Any courtesy the floor comments from anybody? Seeing none, then we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. 28 slides. Yeah.